Good morning, everyone. Once again, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I hope you all are doing well. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, I shall thank you for sharing. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing that, Asha. Awesome. Okay, uh, let's get started, guys. Uh, can I request one of us to uh, just pray and uh, to get started? Thank you. I'm audible, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just request any one of you to just uh, start us off with a word of prayer, please. Shall I pray, Pastor? Father God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, we come to you with thanksgiving in our heart for this new beautiful day. For this time of fellowship and learning about father we thank you that you have promised and you're with us and that you lead us and guide us through the power of your holy spirit we pray to you father bless pastor as he teaches us father talk to us through him about father so that we may learn how to worship you in spirit and in truth to be well equipped for the ministry that you want us to complete on this earth above father and be submitted to you in all ways bless everyone who's joined in bless everyone and lead each of us to do your will above father in all the ways and walks of life continue to be with pastor and continue to bless him and guide him we once again thank you for everything that we are learning because it's your grace and mercy upon our lives we give you glory honor and praise and ask this prayer in the precious and matchless name of jesus our lord and savior amen Amen, amen. Thank you, Abney. Uh, all right, guys, uh, welcome once again uh, to the worship ministry course. Um, I'm excited about just continuing to uh, teach because I'm continuing to learn. Uh, I'm not surprised that every time I prepare or teach or talk on the subject, not necessarily teach, uh, I get excited because uh, I learn so much. That's one of the reasons um, why I enjoy teaching. Uh, on the subject uh, it just moves me and uh, it humbles me it keeps my heart in check um, every time we speak about a character from the bible or things that they've sacrificed or what they've done and how they pursued god passionately with all their heart uh, how zealous they were for the presence of god uh, it, it moves me and i'm sure it moves uh, you as well so uh, i'm excited uh, to just continue teaching so looking forward to learn along with you guys okay uh so in the last class we uh, discussed about the tabernacle of moses uh a little bit in detail uh you know we started off with how uh it was a blueprint that god gave moses right uh like hebrews chapter 8 uh verse 5 it says it's it's a copy it, it, they serve as a shadow right of the heavenly things um the, the tabernacle and the temple uh the pattern it came from god we know that and then moses made a note of all of that and he, he gave it to the israelites to build it uh, build the sanctuary uh and and we see as as it progresses now every time we spoke about the tabernacle we always start from the outer courts inner courts and the holy place uh when we started off last week with the gates and the significance of it but then from Exodus 25, from the first time that God tells Israel, uh, people of Israel, uh, and Moses to build the tabernacle, he starts from the inside out, uh, right? Uh, what is on the inside always matters to him, right? That's what he is going for. Right? And I don't think I have to uh, go deeper about that, what, what matters on the inside, right? Um, in this session, what we, we will be talking is about uh, David's tabernacle, and one of the things that God tells uh, uh, Samuel, Prophet Samuel, is the man looks on the outside, but I look uh, the heart, uh, right? So he is always uh, 
what's on the inside matters to him. So he moves from the inside out, right? From the holy of holies uh, to the most holy place, to the outer courts uh, and whatnot, right? Uh, you can praise God with a group of, with a multitude of people in the outer courts. You can serve him with just a handful of people in the inner courts, uh, like with the team of your ministry, uh, you know, you can serve. But when you get to the holy of holies, uh, there is no more doing anything. Uh, you are you are just there, beholding his glory, uh, encountering him face to face, um, and you worship him only one on one, face to face, right? And you know, in the outer courts, there was the natural light, um, the sunlight, um, and. You, and, and when you step into the inner courts, uh, you have the light from the uh, golden lampstand. But in the Holy of Holies, there was divine light. It was the glory of God that lit up that space. Uh, and right, it is to that space we've been invited, says our Father says, come boldly to the throne of grace. He's not only saying come, uh, he's also addressing the attitude uh, in how we can come. He says, come boldly. Uh, I have made a way. Uh, right. So in every progression we see uh, in the tabernacle of Moses, we see uh, the blueprint uh, and and Jesus in every single thing. Right? In the, at the, the altar of burnt offering, um, we see that he is our sacrifice. And right, it's John chapter 1, verse 29, um, John 1, I think John 1, 29, um, John the Baptist says, there's just so many, too many Johns, sorry guys. <laughs> uh, Behold the Lamb of God that who takes away the sin. Right, He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, at the water, uh, water, water baptism. Okay, um, I think I need to have my coffee. <laughs> uh, water baptism is water basin, uh, the, br the bronze laver. Uh, where it pure where they would have to the priests had to wash their hands and their feet and in parallel we see that how we don't uh you know our righteousness is nothing like filthy rags we know that because G now jesus is our righteousness we don't attain righteousness uh, by doing things right by works that's what ha hand signifies right uh but we still continue to walk this walk of life and hence uh, we are encouraged to cleanse ourselves with the word of God uh, right um, and we saw multiple uh, references to that and then we progress uh, into the table of showbread where Jesus uh, I mean signifies symbolizes that Jesus is the bread of life he says that in John chapter 6 verse 35 that I am the bread of life um, right, um, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word uh, that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right, all these very popular scriptures which we've heard a lot uh, growing up, but then uh, it's very important for us to pause and and ponder, uh, have those sailor moments, as we would say. Right, and I am the bread of life. Okay, what does it mean to me? Um, right, and so we continue to see Jesus in every symbol uh, in the in the tabernacle of Moses, golden lampstand. Again, Jesus in John chapter eight, uh, verse twelve says, "I am the light of the world." Um, right, and also light brings revelation. And when you read the book uh, John chapter nine, the whole chapter, it's about uh, Jesus uh, heals the man uh, who is blind from birth. Um, and then somehow he's like drawing a parallel with the blindness of the. He's saying, "Okay, don't be like this." Um, so, uh, I am the light of the world, uh, and the light brings revelation. Um, and I'm I'm reminded of this uh, quote by C.S. Lewis. Uh, anybody here like C.S. Lewis? Right. Um, yeah. I knew Tarun's hand would go up for sure. <laughs> uh, screw tape letters. Uh, I mean, uh, you gotta love those. It's brilliant. Uh, so he, one of his quote, he says, uh, "I believe in Christianity uh, as I believe in the sunrise, uh, not only because I see it, 
but because by it I see all things. It's, it's a beautiful quote. Uh, and not mention this another popular verse from Psalm 119, verse 100 and, uh, verse 105. Uh, this famous song, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right? He reveals, the light reveals uh, things. So Jesus is the light of the world. And uh, and at the altar of incense, uh, is which represents, uh, symbolizes uh, the altar of intercession, uh, once again, we see that in John chapter 17 itself, um, you know, where he intercedes for us, right? Um, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't read John chapter 17, I would encourage you to do that. We see how Jesus um, is standing in the gap, who's interceding on our behalf. Uh, and yeah, I can go on. I'm um, just doing a very quick recap. It seems to be a very extensive summary of the last class. Uh, but and the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so we started the need for the tabernacle from Genesis because of sin and how it separated us, our spirit, from the spirit of God. Uh, we were deprived, uh, you know, we were dead in sin. So the tabernacle of Moses was God's resting place, uh, which he didn't have for approximately 2,500 odd years from the time of the fall to somewhere in Exodus 25. Um, it was God building a bridge between heaven and earth, uh, you know, trying to mend a tear. Um, and it's very significant. And I always say that it's very important for every Christian to understand uh, the significance of the tabernacle of Moses for us for us to understand the new covenant and what we've been given. Uh, for us to appreciate the new, we need to understand the old. Um, that's my take on it, right? Um, and so I hope you've been learning um, something about it um, as well. So uh, this class will start uh, uh, the David's tabernacle. Right? Um, you guys okay? Yes, Pastor. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. Awesome. Cool. All right. Let's go. Um, so, uh, in your notes, I think it's page 22. Um, now, just as a, a quick background, um, a backstory uh, is always important isn't it to set the context now just as the need for the tabernacle of moses was in genesis uh chapter two or three because of the fall um the tabernacle of david also has a backstory um so for that let's go to uh, the book of uh, first samuel go with me way before david even is in the scene for Samuel chapter four. Where are you, Samuel? Okay, there you are. Okay. Um, okay, so first Samuel, um, Chapter four. Now, uh, another background in the background <laughs> uh, is uh, the uh, there's a high priest called Eli. He had two sons who were wicked. Um, there was no relationship with God, and during this time, um, they were doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, right in broad daylight. Uh, that's what's happening. So basically, there was there is no relationship between God and, and the people because they were doing a lot of wicked things. Uh, but but it is a, a time like this they are being attacked. So that's where that's the setting. Okay, uh, First Samuel chapter four. It says now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphak. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. 
And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battle field. When the soldiers returned to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Very important. Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people went, sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, of, uh, camp, all Israel raised such a great shout. Okay, if you remember one of the Hebrew words for praise is Shabach, which means a violent rage shout. Right? In the first year, <laughs> they raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp. They said, We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. Be strong, Philistines, be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man... So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated. And every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. I want you to underline this next line. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. How many? 30,000. The ark of God was captured. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. And so, not to read the whole chapter, uh, the news goes to Eli, um, verse 16. Okay, just to fast forward, verse 16 from chapter 4. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line, I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God was, has been captured. Verse 18. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward of his thrown by the side of the gate. He fell and he broke his neck and he died. For he was an old man and heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of god and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband she said the glory has been departed from israel for the ark has been captured 
too much of reading for one day or for one class. Um, but I wanted us to read. I wanted us to really uh, kind of at least understand the gravity of, of what's happening. Um, talk about having a bad day. <laughs> Uh, this is a very, very bad day in the history of Israel. Right? Um, so many things. So where do we start? Where do we begin? They thought they could just uh, step into a battle, uh, carry the Ark of God into the battle without having any intimacy, intimate relationship with him, doing all the evil things, uh, living an immoral life. Uh, but because something has been done in the past for victory because they took the ark of the covenant into battles in the past and god gave them victory god went before them um, because of that they thought they could live off history but it didn't happen right um they lost and they lost big time to say the least uh, how many soldiers how many foot soldiers were killed Talk to me, guys. How many foot soldiers? 30,000. Yeah, 30,000. Um, and so, Ark of God was captured. We'll come to that later. Okay, so 30,000 people have died. Hearing this news, um, Eli, the leader, the judge leader at that point in time of Israel, he breaks his head, his neck, and he dies. His two sons are dead. Eli's daughter-in-law, um, whose wife? Phinehas. Yeah, uh, Phinehas' wife, right? Yeah. Um, she dies, giving birth to a son, naming him Ichabod, which means glory has departed. The presence of God has left. Israel in the Old Testament uh, was a symbol of, uh, they were known as the people of God, right? So the presence of God has left, had left the people of God, right? The glory of God had left the people of God, God's covenant people. Then you, uh, it's one of, it's a very tragic thing, isn't it? Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Samson's story is like when Delilah cut his hair off, it says that Samson did not know that God's glory had left him. Um, it's very tragic. So, a very, very bad day in the history of Israel. Um, so that is like the back background. I, I'm sure you already knew all this, but then I just want, you know, for benefit of all of us to just go through this. So from that time till David becomes king in 2 Samuel, it's about from 1 Samuel chapter 4 till 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, where until when David decides to bring the ark back. It's about 70, 75 years, give or take. Okay. Once again, for 75 years or so, no one felt the need until David to bring the presence of God back into Jerusalem. Before David, Saul was the king. But Saul was all about position and not about presence. When Saul had sinned, he tells Samuel, okay, Samuel, just walk along with me, come out with me, so that the people will know that the God is still with me. Right? He, he was all about position and not about presence. While well, David was about the presence. Right, for 75 years, uh, it's like, okay, the first thing that he does is, well, I don't want to go forward without his presence. 
if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want this leadership. I don't want this position. I don't want this kingship that, that you've given me. So if you've given me something, it's something beautiful about David, right? And we all know uh, like God chose him because he was the man after God's own heart. We need to remind ourselves every time and again, why has God chosen us? Why has, why has God chosen me? Why has God chosen you? Is it because of the gifts and talents uh, that we have? And in that process, do we forget uh, who gave us the gift and the talents? Or is it his favor? Or is it his mercy? Or is it his grace and his faithfulness towards us? Um, right? And somewhere I feel like David is reminded of this. Okay, I was a shepherd boy. I was a nobody. Um, nobody wanted me. My own family, they didn't like me. They rejected me. Uh, I was rejected, uh, not ostracized. Just, um, had no, almost no value, so to speak. Um, and then says, okay, it is him, it is God who's brought me this far. How can I go forward uh, without his presence? Right? Um, so that's where David is. Um, and now we see... Um, the, okay, let's go to let's go to Second Samuel. We'll jump an entire book. <laughs> uh, we we'll go to Second Samuel chapter six. Uh, actually, you know, um, I don't want to go through. Uh, we all know the story, uh, right? Uh, but um, okay. Okay, uh, this is this is awesome. Okay, let's go to Second Samuel chapter six. Um, sorry. Great. When you're there, give me a thumbs up or an amen. It's just so. Second Samuel chapter six. Okay. Um, so here we go. David is David defeat has defeated the Philistines now. Um, So a lot has happened, right? In the seventy or five, seventy-five years, uh, you know, the Philistines captured it. Uh, you know, they keep it in their temple of uh, God, Dagon, and Dagon falls down day one. Second night, he falls down, breaks his neck, and they can't handle him. They send it away. So a lot of things has happened. I'm not going into all those details because uh, we don't have the time. But I would encourage you to look into all what has happened. Okay, uh, right. Second Samuel chapter six, verse one. David. Again, brought together out of Israel a chosen men. How many? How many? Thirty thousand. Does that sound a little familiar? Thirty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. On the day that the ark was taken, 30,000 men died. I'm sure David knew about this history. And so uh, this verse doesn't give uh, like the proper detail uh, of it. But uh, let's go to First Chronicles chapter 13. Okay, First Chronicles chapter 13. I, I hope you're there. First Chronicles, no, First Corinthians, guys. First Chronicles, some classic. Okay, First Chronicles, you guys there? Okay. Verse one, two, and three. Okay, it says. Actually, why don't one of you read? Verse one, two, and three. First Chronicles thirteen. One of you read, please. Can I read, Pastor? Yes, please. Uh, David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord, our God, let us send word 
far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel and also the priests and the Levites who are with them in their towns and the pasture land to come and join. Let us bring the ark of our God and ba back to us for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. Thank you. You're most pleased. Uh, right. um, so David, uh, in his very last line, he says, uh, we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. Right? Uh, and so David was well aware during the reign of Saul, that the Ark of Co the Covenant was not there, and he knew that it was supposed to be there. And in, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, we see that David, it only says David again brought together out of Israel, chosen men, 30,000 of all, uh, right? Uh, but I like this first uh, Chronicles 13 because it says that he had a team meeting, <laughs> right? Uh, he had a very big team meeting. Uh, right, talk about a round table a conference or whatnot. It's like, okay, guys, let's huddle up. Uh, this is where we are. This is what we're going to do. Who's with me? And then they go and bring their ark back. Right? So that's the whole story uh, of David's tabernacle, even if we, before we get start talking about the nuances of the tabernacle of David. Um, right, so you guys with me so far? Okay, uh, I'm yes. gonna take that as yes. All right, cool. So now, um, we're in First Chronicles, we'll go to uh, we'll start learning about his tabernacle a little bit and about how he went about setting it up. Uh, right, we'll go to First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16. Um, I'll, I'll read a few scriptures for us. Um, so it says, They brought the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before God. After David had finished sacrificing and the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each Israelite man and woman. He appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to make petition, to give thanks, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay, so let's just pause there. And um, so just a few points in your notes that's mentioned is David set the ark in a tent right at the tabernacle in Jerusalem he had raised for it then blessed the people and celebrated uh, David did not bring the ark into his residence like Obed Edom uh, David blessed the people and provided a meal um, it's almost like foreshadowing the supper of the lamb uh, that's first chronicles 1 to 3 right he sets up a tent it, it, I, I like it what it says that it says David pitched for it. Uh, it's almost like you know he he started getting his hands dirty. He went and you know just pitched this tent, um, tent of meeting, tent the tabernacle, and then David appoints Levites to minister to God by remembering, thanking, and praising. That's uh, from verse four uh, and till verse six. Uh, verse six of First Chronicles chapter sixteen ends with like this. It says. Uh, they were regularly uh, there to minister before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Regularly, right? Um, so, excuse me, guys. My internet is saying something wrong. Did I get cut off or not? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it's uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, right. So, uh, first thing he he 
you know, David sets uh, the ark in the tent that he pitched. Uh, he sets Levites to minister before God by remembering. Uh, you know, he even writes songs for them uh, from verse 7 when you see that day David first committed to Asaph and his associates this psalm of thanks to the Lord. Uh, means he wrote this song on the day the ark was brought and he gave it to Asaph and it's like, okay, you put them to music. Uh, right. And uh, and we say that the Levites were to minister before the Lord regularly. That means day and night and night and day. Uh, First Chronicles 16, 37 and 38 says, so he left Asaph and his brothers there to minister before the ark regularly as every day's work required. Uh, and Obedidom with his 68 brethren to be gatekeepers. All right. So uh, he um he delegated so to speak right he made teams okay uh once again like how we saw uh how worship was organized uh when we just went through the whole lot uh it was very organized right everybody knew what they had to do uh there was a modern word to use would be a roster uh right? if you i prepare the worship team roster for apc uh it is not a fun job to do it's yeah, <laughs> getting people's availability and balancing the teams, sending them to different locations, making sure uh, the children church uh, worship uh, teams are all set. So rostering is not fun, but uh, I'm sure these guys had fun. Uh, everybody were excited, uh, you know, was zealous to serve before God. So uh, the work was regular, it was consistent, it was ongoing day and night. Um, and uh, we'll read more, we'll learn more about it in chapter 25 in just a minute. Uh, but as a conclusion to this, uh, to this session at least, um, we, we see this very famous scripture from Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, which is being quoted in Acts chapter 15, verse 13 and 18. Verse 13 and 18. Is that God is in the business of rebuilding the tabernacle of David? Right. Uh, a lot of things to ponder about it, and I've been pondering uh, is uh, we see that the Ark of the Covenant was kept in a tent which David pitched. Right. Uh, it was a tent. And then here we see that, uh, uh, let me just read that verse, uh, Acts 15, 13, 18. It says, and after they had become silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out, to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, verse 16. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of the mankind may seek the Lord and even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things known to God from eternity are all his works. Um, I've always wondered, you know, why God says, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David uh, and, you know, and not the temple of Solomon or because which is so much more grander, right? With it was made up of gold uh, everywhere, you know, left, right and center. It was just more royal and and whatnot. And everything was happening there as well. Uh, and why the tabernacle of David? Uh, you know, I've always wondered. Um, it was a thing. Is it's just my thought? Uh, you know, it's again. It comes down to the person of who David was, right? Uh, David was so many things. Uh, we know that, right? He was a shepherd boy. Uh, he, he he was a worshiper. He was a musician. Uh, he was he became a warrior. He was always was a warrior, even as a shepherd. Um, but in every season of his life, uh, he felt the need to go after God. Right? That in every season, 
he felt the need that he knew that he needed God. Right? Um, I, was I was talking about Psalm 23. Uh, he says, The Lord is my shepherd. The scholars say that David wrote that psalm somewhere during the latter part uh, of his kingly days. Right? Um, the time when he was a king of Israel. Now, as a king of a nation, uh, you are powerful. You have everything you need. Um, right? You, you have people who will do what you tell them to do. Uh, all the power, all the riches, um, all the wealth in the world. Right? That's the position where uh, David is. And even in that season of life where he has everything and whatnot, he pauses and says, the Lord is my shepherd. Right? He's acknowledging the Lordship of God. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. When he says that, um, he's submitting himself, saying, okay, I'm the sheep. And there is a shepherd uh, who's leading me, who's guiding me. I shall not want. Right? He's not saying, I shall not want because I'm the king of Israel. I have everything I need. Uh, he's saying, I shall not want because the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, and I think it's just the heart and the posture of David's heart of, for worship, for God, uh, is, is, you know, is what the significance behind this whole verse is, and and I see it, um, and I see worship movements be uh, rising up all across the globe. House of Prayers, uh, you know, like IHOP, International House of Prayer. This, like, that's just one of the examples uh, where God is raising up houses of prayers um, where there's worship, word, and intercession going on day and night, um, you know, 24 hours a day, non-stop. And, uh, and all of that, in so many ways, you see that God is rebuilding the tabernacle of David, uh, a generation of people uh, who are not up for fame, uh, who are seeing the need for the presence, and they are not worried about the position on a stage um, or a fame and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, if, if there's any encouragement uh, for us, uh, you know, who are who are, we are learning about worship ministry, and for those who will be who are leading a ministry, who will be leading a ministry, and if you're not leading a ministry, that's just fine because uh, it all comes down to that posture of a worshiper, isn't it? Uh, and as it says in John chapter four, uh, you know, for the Father is seeking uh, worshippers, right? True worshippers. It's interesting that it says that a father is not uh, if father is seeking worship. It doesn't say that. Rather, he's seeking worshippers. Uh, you know, so because he knows that if he finds a true worshipper, uh, only worship is going to arise from his heart. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the Lord is rebuilding the tabernacle of day, uh, David in our day and time among His saints, um, and. Um, and that's very encouraging to see, right? Uh, any thoughts, guys, so far? I feel like I'm talking quite a bit. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll pause here and uh, we'll take uh, a break. We'll uh, a little extra break, <laughs> and I'll see you all at ten. Okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> 